welcome to this series on the lithosphere and the wealth of resources that are available to be extracted from the earth. So, what exactly is the lithosphere? Let's find out from Kiki. Most of us have heard the word lithosphere before. The term litho comes from an ancient Greek word which means rock. So, literally, lithosphere means rocky sphere. This should give you some major clues as to what this series of lessons will be about. The lithosphere is the part of our planet that we're most familiar with and where most of our activities take place. We depend on the lithosphere in many ways. It's on this surface that we walk each day. People grow crops in the soil of the lithosphere and use rocks for shelter and to build their homes and other structures. The lithosphere also contains many useful mineral resources such as gold, iron and coal which we have used through human history for different purposes. In this series, we will focus on the mineral wealth of the lithosphere. We will find out about how people extract and use certain minerals in particular and how their ability to do this has developed over time. We will also consider the impact, both positive and negative, of the extraction and processing of these minerals on society and on the environment. Most of us are familiar with the idea that we get minerals such as gold, coal and diamonds from underground. But the question is, what exactly are they and how did they get there in the first place? Well, the best place to start answering these questions is by understanding a little bit more about the Earth's structure. Most of us know that there's a solid surface beneath our feet. In some places, the surface is covered in sand and in others, by the water of the oceans. But underneath both these is solid rock. This hard, solid, rocky surface is called the Earth's crust. Just like a crust of bread is quite thin, so is the Earth's crust. On the land, the crust thickness varies between 30 and 70 kilometers, but under the sea, the crust is only about 6 kilometers thick. One of the ways we can think about the structure of the Earth is to compare it to an onion. The thin skin is like the thin crust of the Earth that we live on, but there are also quite a few layers underneath the crust. Geologists have developed models to represent these different layers of the Earth. The three main layers have been given the names the crust, the mantle and the core. As you know, the bit we are interested in today is the lithosphere. The lithosphere is made up of the solid rocky crust and the uppermost part of the mantle closest to the surface. Now that we know a little bit more about the structure of the lithosphere, we can start our investigation of how the minerals came to form here. We can define a mineral as an inorganic substance with a definite chemical composition. The atoms of each element are arranged in a particular pattern in different minerals. Just like the many layers of the atmosphere interact with each other to make life possible on Earth, the different layers of Earth itself interact in dynamic processes to form rocks and minerals that humankind has been using throughout the ages. Now that we know a little bit more about the structure of the Earth, we can find out how the minerals came to be in the lithosphere. Let me introduce you to Professor Terence McCarthy, who will tell us more. Most of the chemical e elements of the periodic table occur in combination with other things. Natural chemical compounds, though, belong to a category of compound which we call minerals. So the Earth is really made up of minerals which are natural chemical compounds. Now the Earth as a whole is layered, like the layers inside an onion. You could slice through the Earth, this is what it would look like. Um, we have the outer layer, the outermost layer, which is the crust, and then underneath that, uh, part of what we call the, the mantle, that's shown in this interval there, that's the mantle. The uppermost part of the mantle, shown here in this orangey color, is fairly rigid and it is bonded fairly tightly onto this very thin outer skin, the crust. And then below the lithosphere is a slippery zone which is called the asthenosphere. That's the uppermost part of this more reddish zone. And this is a very, very important zone, this asthenosphere. It's about 100 kilometers thick and in the zone the rocks are just starting to melt so they're very squishy and plastic and that's very important. You can think of a molten rock um, much like a, a solution you know if you were to take uh, for example a lot of sugar say a cup of sugar and dissolve it in a large tumbler of water give it a good stir dissolve all the sugar that gives you a completely homogeneous looking substance 
But that is in fact a solution. That's exactly what a magma is. It's a complicated solution. If you took that sugar and water solution and put it in your deep freeze and, let, and froze it, it would freeze into two kinds of crystals. Crystals of sugar and crystals of ice. In other words, the, the homogeneous material would split into its natural chemical compounds. And exactly the same thing happens with a magma. It's a complex solution of different kinds of minerals and it's homogeneous. So when that molten rock intrudes, it's a completely homogeneous mixture. But once it starts to solidify, in other words, crystallize, it crystallizes into separate minerals. And the size of those mineral grains depends on how quickly it crystallizes. So magma that crystallizes very slowly has coarse grains and magma that crystallizes very quickly has fine grains, fine crystals. Now, these, this outer part, the lithosphere, is, is fairly rigid. And so it uh, behaves as, um, as a fairly uh, solid, solid body. But it's sliding on a slippery surface. Now, it's like walking. You can imagine when you're walking with very smooth shoes on a, on a smooth patio with, uh, that's wet. You know how easy it is to slip. And that's precisely what happens between the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. There's a zone there. Uh, which enables the lithosphere, that's the crust in the upper part of the mantle, to slide. And this gives rise to a very, very important um, geological process which is known as plate tectonics. Scientists worked out that the continents, particularly South America and Africa, must have been joined together. These two fit perfectly and they figured that these two must have been joined together. But they couldn't really understand how these continents could move. How could these continents slide over to the solid rock which forms the ocean floor and separate? And that was a big problem until the 1960s. As recently as that, scientists realize, realize that in fact what is happening is as these continents move apart, a tear is created in the Earth's crust. And molten rock arises, rises up from the asthenosphere in the crack, in that tear, to create new new ocean floor and that pushes the continents apart. So this process then <coughs> is ongoing and it's, the, uh, it for, it's occurring along all the mid-ocean ridges of which there are many that surround the entire globe. All of them are on the ocean floor and it's at these places that new ocean crust is being created and it's the creation of this new ocean crust that allows the continents to move around on the surface of the earth. But of course the Earth is a sphere and it's got a constant surface area. So if you're making new crust in one place by, for example, separating Africa from South America, in order to do that you have to make new crust between them, you're creating additional area on the sphere of the Earth. So that means in other places the crust has to be destroyed. And this occurs in a process known as subduction and it's responsible it creates very characteristic topography and is responsible for many of the world's uh, violent earthquakes and volcanoes. One can see the main region of destruction running up the coast of the Americas, around past Alaska through the Aleutians, down past Japan and into Southeast Asia, around here through Indonesia and down past New Zealand. That's the main region of the world today where crust is being destroyed in order to compensate for the creation of new crust. This uh, slab of ocean crust that's going down. This produces volcanoes on surface and the squeezing effect creates the bulge, which is the topography, the high mountains associated with these parts of the world. The high mountains, of course, are characterized by rapid erosion. So these are constantly being attacked by ice, by rivers, and so on. And that material is being recycled and uh, transported down into the ocean trenches as sediment. That sediment is getting squeezed up um, and eventually it in turn gets metamorphosed. So we have a whole cycle taking place here of uh, conversion of rock from sedimentary material through a metamorphic rock to an igneous rock uh, and then back into a sedimentary rock. So this is known as the rock cycle. We can characterize then rocks into different kinds of classes. Um, the igneous rocks are the ones um, like this granite here for example, or this rock here that's called a gabbro. These crystallize from a molten uh, um, um, from a molten state and those are called igneous rocks and they vary some of them are very fine grained if they crystallize quickly others are coarse grained if they crystallize more slowly then you've got uh, sedimentary rocks which are produced by erosion of pre-existing rocks whatever they might be 
They, we, they get transported by wind, but most commonly by water, and finally deposited, such as, for example, this mudstone. Um, these are sedimentary rocks, and most sedimentary rocks are deposited in oceans around the edges of continents. And then, in the terms of the rock cycle, as a result of plate tectonics, um, these um, sedimentary and, of course, igneous rocks as well become compressed and they undergo change because of heating and pressure, and this gives rise then to metamorphic rocks. Um, so, for example, a shale will firstly become a slate, which will then become a schist, and then finally, as it starts to melt, becomes a rock, a very patchy rock like this called a gneiss, um, and then ultimately will produce an igneous rock. Plate tectonics, we see it active on the Earth's surface today, and certainly it's the dominant geological process that shapes the Earth. But we're beginning to understand that plate tectonics is a very, very ancient process, and uh, probably dates back um, for thousands of millions of years. This rock here, for example, this pillow lava, it's a blob of lava that was erupted on the ocean floor 3,400 million years ago, formed on an ocean floor very, very similar in all respects to the modern day ocean floor. So we can comfortably say that 3,400 million years ago, the process of plate tectonics was already operational. And it's constantly been, recy been recycling the Earth's crust. Now, the, the recycling affects mainly the ocean floors. The continents tend to be floating around like little corks on this more dense ocean floor so that the, the continents have a much better chance of surviving the processes of destruction, which take crust destruction, which take place in plate tectonics. And this is why we find the oldest rocks on Earth on the continents. Plate tectonics is important in another respect, particularly from a, from a, a mineral resource point of view, in that this constant recycling, which takes place as part of the plate tectonic process, um, is continually um, redistributing and, and occasionally concentrating minerals up to amounts where it becomes economically viable to extract them. And there are several types of mineral deposit that owe their origin entirely to this process of plate tectonics. Perhaps one of the most spectacular ones are the copper deposits. As we mentioned in this model, uh, when we discussed this model, that the destruction of the ocean floor as it slides down here, it melts, and the blobs of melt rise up. These are magmas. Many of these magmas never make the surface. They crystallize at depth. And in the process of crystallization, the heat and the water that they give off concentrates many minerals, particularly copper, molybdenum, and gold. So many of the world's great copper mines today are in fact a product, a direct product, of this process of, uh, of uh, destruction of ocean, of ocean floor. Another very important type of mineral deposit <coughs> forms as a result of hot spring activity in an ocean ridge. Here we have hot magma coming up it's under sea, um, and the circulation of seawater through these hot rocks around this re region extracts metals such as copper and cobalt and lead and zinc and they become precipitated in the Rift Valley, and this gives rise to a very important class of mineral deposit. So this constant recycling of the, of the Earth's crust is responsible for many of our mineral resources uh, that we so depend on today. So how have people benefited from these minerals in the lithosphere? Let us go back to Kiki to hear about this. Through the ages, people have extracted minerals from rocks to use for different purposes. These special minerals are called ores. The discovery of ores and people's ability to extract the metal within them has been very important to our technological development. Today, our modern technology and lifestyles depend on the use of a large range of minerals. Everywhere you look, there's evidence of this. Take cars, for example. The glass of the windscreen of a car is made from silicates and feldspar. The body is made from steel, the alloy of iron, carbon and manganese. Copper is used in the electrical wiring, platinum is used as a catalyst in the exhaust, lead is used in the battery and as weight to balance the wheels. The paint contains cadmium, titanium and mica, 
all these minerals come from the rock of the lithosphere. But whatever the mineral, it has to be extracted from the rock in which it is found. If the rock containing the mineral is near the surface, it can be dug up in the process called open cast or open pit mining. If the mineral rich rock is deep underground, far more complicated mining operations have to be set up. Conditions in mines are often unpleasant and dangerous. Once on the surface, the minerals have to be separated from the rest of the rock. Usually, mechanical processes are used to crush the rock up and then chemical processes are used to separate the mineral wanted from the rest of the material. In these processes, huge dumps of waste material accumulate and the air and water become polluted. Mining and mineral processing can have a negative effect on the environment and on people's health. However, mining companies have taken special precautions to minimize these effects and their work is controlled by the acts of their government. Generally, finding rich deposits of valuable minerals can boost the country's economy. Mining and mineral processing creates jobs, provides resources for industry within the country, can earn foreign money through export and can be important strategically for a country in foreign relations. South Africa is very fortunate in having some of the best reserves of minerals in the world. This map shows where most of our important minerals are mined. These diagrams illustrate the important role that minerals play in our economy. Almost one third of our income from exports is earned from mineral exports and 5% of all people employed in activities other than agriculture are employed in the mining industry. South Africa really has amazing wealth below our feet. Grade 11s, as we have discussed the mineral resources available to us, I hope you are keen to learn more about the lithosphere. You'll find more information at www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Until next time.